lecture I'm going to talk about corpus linguistics and I'm going to talk around um, the chapter by cutting uh, which is um, cutting A6 and then the readings in the section D6. Um, to begin with um, let's have a look at um, some of the um, key words I'm going to be um, key concepts I'm going to be covering here. So um, we talk about a corpus, um, an electronic body of um, data. More than one corpus is a corpora. And the whole uh, approach to looking at large quantities of, of text, electronic text, is the study of corpus linguistics. And the tool that's used um, in cor uh, corpus linguistics is what's called a concordance program, uh, or more appropriately, a concordance. And a concordance has the ability to search massive amounts of electronic text and produce what's called the concordance line. And in that concordance line, there will be a particular word, um, which is the target word, and it will illustrate all the different contexts that that word occurs in. It will also give you a, a, a frequency list, a list of the most um, common occurring words. Um, we're also going to look at word clusters. Uh, for example, um, um, at the end of, uh, a part of, um, these are um, uh, groups of words that frequently occur together. Uh, we'll also look at collocations. Collocations take one word and then look at all the other words that attach themselves to that word. So if you take a, a word like day, you, a, co a collocation with that would be a bad day, a good day, uh, the day of your life, etc. Um, annotation refers to the way that an electronic text um, can um, have what are called tags and the tags uh, are various particular types of um, tags, uh, most often uh, grammatical tags um, uh, or parts of speech. Uh, those could be tags that uh, allow you to search for nouns uh, or even proper nouns, adjectives, adverbs, verbs, etc. Um, domains of um, discourse refer to particular discourse genre um, and uh, uh, Often, um, mini corpora uh, are often devoted to specific domains of discourse. Uh, we'll be looking at one, um, which is looking at um, um, academic discourse. Um, we use the term um, communities of practice to refer to um, uh, groups of people who usually um, meet face to face um, for a shared activity. And that's a way of beginning to look at different kinds of language use based upon um, these communities of practice. It might be um, uh, a group of uh, people who um, meet in the universe of, of superheroes, comics, the comic place, uh, to play magic. And the kinds of language they use are very specific to their particular common interests. Um, and then we'll have a look at some of the critiques of uh, corpus linguistics and um, uh, uh, look at um, the um, different types of data. Um, attested uh, or corpus data is data which is, has been said by somebody else and is collected. It's authentic, naturally occurring data. Um, as opposed to that, the kind of language uh, you find in syntax books, for example, uh, often makes use of what is called invented or introspected data. And they both have values um, in linguistics, and we'll be talking a little bit about that. Okay, so as I said, um, uh, a corpus is a large collection of naturally occurring authentic texts, and it can be spoken or written. And the key thing is that it's stored in an electronic database uh, and can be accessed by a computer. Um, in this um, little lecture movie, um, these links don't work, so I can't click on it and take you. But here's an example. What I'd like you to do is go through the, um, uh, the PowerPoint, put it in full screen, 
and then you'll be able to um, click on this particular uh, link. Um, here's a, um, a, a big corpus, Corpus of contem uh, Contemporary American English called COCA, and you can go there and you can play around with that. You can put in words and it will search and it will tell you, give you the frequency of that word and it will also give you the context in which it appears. You might want to put in one of your favorite words. Um, it's a, I think it's a, well, it says 2012. It may have all, not all the uh, uh, um, contemporary occurrences of particular words. Um, so, for example, I think the other day I put in the word twerk, T-W-I-R-K, and it only came up with um, two um, hits. I think um, a more modern corpus, including 2013, would probably have a lot more hits for twerk than I found. Okay, so that's a general corpus, and it tends to be made up of newspapers, uh, academic um, texts, uh, conversation, and fiction. Um, so, um, different types of corpora, and, and that COCA, as I said, is a general um, um, uh, corpus. It aims to be representative of all different types of language, um, so has talk, fiction, newspapers, academic writing. Um, we can also access many different um, uh, uh, corpora of world Englishes, so we're not just um, looking at standard American or standard British uh, English, but we can look at some particular uh, minority um, dialects. So if you click on that link there, it will take you to a, uh, a corpus of Scottish English. And if you'd like to search there, you can put in the word use, that's Y-O-U-S, uh, and see what you find. Uh, it's very interesting. Use in Scottish English is similar to you all in Southern American um, English to refer to you plural. Um, we can also um, have a look at um, um, uh, corpora of particular uh, dialects. And so if you want to go and click that one, it will take you to a dialect of English called Geordie, which is spoken in the um, north um, east of England. Um, you also, with, uh, it's not just English, of course, that you can um, uh, find uh, corpora of. Um, every language in the world now has um, a, a corpus, and this can be very useful for many things, but especially for language learning. Um, so you might want to go and have a look at uh, this one here. Uh, this is an Italian corpus. And if you wanted to put in uh, something like coglione, that was the Italian word meaning uh, literally testicles, or as we've discovered, it really means moron. That's C-O-G-L-I-O-N-E. And then see what hits you get. You might find that difficult because um, there's a lot of complex language there. Um, and finally, there are um, uh, corpora that uh, focus on specific um, discourse domains. And here's a very good one. This is um, uh, my case. Um, and if you click on this, what it will take you to and show you is, is about one and a half million words of academic um, discourse, uh, both written and spoken, but all within the domain of academia. And if you wanted, you could uh, put in some... Uh, some what we call discourse markers and see how they use. For example, furthermore, in addition, um, very similar meanings, but are they actually, are they the same? Are they used the same? So you can play around with all those links and go to those different corpora and just have a look at um, the kinds of things you can do with um, a corpus. Um, the particular um, uh, instrument that's used with uh, a body of electronic um, data is called a concordance uh, uh, program and the actual name of the of the um, instrument is an actual concordance so all those particular um, uh, links I showed you on the previous page have a built-in concordance um, and what concordances can do is two main things um, they can tell you about the number of occurrences of a, or a word or a phrase, and they can also give you a concordance line. And a concordance line, as you see, is the line going across there. 
uh, with the particular target word um, um, in bold in the middle. And a concordance line will tell you all the kind of words that go on the left side of your target and all the words that go on the right side of your target. And by ordering and resorting uh, the lines, you can begin to see what kinds of things hang together linguistically. And from that, you can begin to come to some conclusions about how language works. Um, the other thing, of course, that uh, um, concordances can do is um, uh, frequency lists. Um, and this is um, a frequency list of um, the novels of Leo Tolstoy. Um, and when you do a frequency list of virtually any um, uh, set of electronic data, um, usually the first 20 or maybe 30 words are, um, are what we call function words. These are parts of speech, for example, definite articles, conjunctions like and, prepositions like to, of. It's only when you go way down the list that you get to a, um, a content word. And I think you can see a content word there. Um, I don't think we have got one. Mm -hmm. Well, we've got said <laughs> is more of a content word, but it's still kind of a very common word. Okay, so at the beginning of um, the most frequent words, what we call function words, and you can use this once you've gone, you've got rid of the function words, then you can begin to look at the content of a text by looking at the most frequent words. And um, in um, in this folder, in this lecture folder, there is some data from a couple of movies, um, Friday Night Lights and Any Given Sunday, which are about, both have um, halftime um, speeches by football coaches. And you can see some of the frequency count for those speeches. And that allows you to see something about the content of those speeches. Okay, we'll return to that later, but you can just access that at any time you want in the um, folder. Um, a couple of other things we can look at is word clusters. I mentioned these before. And these are, are words that tend to um, hang together. Um, and, um, and if you look here, um, you can see uh, one of the, a lot of, the end of, um, uh, and many other things there. Um, and so these are words that go together, what we call word clusters. And um, that needs to be um, uh, contrasted with what we call collocations. So um, we take one word and we look at all the other words that go together with that particular um, uh, word. So the word we got here is system. So system appears in all these particular lists. Um, of the system is the most um, uh, uh, frequent collocation. But it's interesting if you go down there, you get to um, criminal justice system. And um, that's pretty high on the list. So um, that's a very strong collocation. Um, annotation, instead of just all looking for words, we can actually look for particular um, features of um, speech and writing. Um, so um, a tag is where somebody, uh, the programmer, puts a little tag on a word to say what it is from, say, a lexical point of view. So for example, you can, um, uh, if you go back to that coca, you will find a POS button. And if you press the, if you, if you open the dialog bo box of that POS, you'll find um, different kinds of um, parts of speech. One of them is uh, a noun, and you can choose between a proper noun, an abstract noun, or a common noun. So um, if you hit that tag, it will give you all the, say, proper nouns in that particular text. 
Uh, grammatical tags, tags refer to specific uh, parts of speech like nouns, adjectives, verbs, etc. Um, uh, phonetic tags uh, can be tell you about stress and intonation. Um, there are also turn-taking tags, which um, also tell you about things like pauses, overlaps, interruptions. And there are even paralinguistic tags, so you can search for laughter or <gasps> in-breath, which is a very common feature of spoken language. So if you go to um, uh, COCA and look for the POS um, tab, and then open that and you'll look at all the kinds of tags you can choose from in that corpus. Um, domains of discourse, um, I mentioned that um, uh, my case, which is academic English, uh, uh, concentrates um, on that particular de domain of, of, um, of discourse. Okay. Um, what is it? It's, well, these, these are interactions that are, are typical of specific settings. Um, and we mentioned the um, uh, people playing magic cards at the um, universe of superheroes on Washington Street. Um, well, it could be the kinds of conversations that happen in hairdressers or restaurants or, um, or, or classrooms. Um, these are domains of, uh, of discourse. And so what corpus linguistics does is helps researchers to discover the features of language used in these specific areas, um, situations and contexts, and what is said and how. And what I was referring to earlier, if you go to this and have a look at the data from uh, these two movies, you can have a look at the kinds of language through frequency counts that occurs in a half-time speech uh, at a football, for a football team. More specifically, um, as the notion of discourse communities are the same, same meaning, communities of practice. And um, this has been described this way, the common ways in which members of a social group use language to meet their social needs. Um, not only the grammatical, lexical, and phonological features of their language, um, for example, teenage talk, professional jargon, political rhetoric, differentiate them from others. Okay, So um, all these particular communi communities of practice speak in particular ways that differentiate them from each other. So if you're moving through these different communities, you will change the way you speak. So the community of practice in your family, when you're talking to your grandmother or your grandfather, is quite different to the way you're going to talk to your roommates, which is another community of practice. Um, uh, and it also differs in the topics they choose to talk about, um, the way they present information, the style with which they interact, or in other words, their what has often been called their discourse accent. So that's the nature of communities of practice. And so we can build, and hopefully this was your assignment, and in um, research assignment, we'll um, try to build a particular um, mini corpus which is focused on a particular community of practice. And down the bottom there is a list of kind of possible um, uh, communities of practice, um, high school cliques, bowling teams, learning community, dorm room, sorority, rugby team, high school soccer fans, trading football, stickers and cards, etc. Um, some of the um, uh, uses of corpus linguistics, and um, the most obvious one is in the compilation of dictionaries and grammars, and um, that's caused quite a revolution in the way that um, dictionaries and grammars are produced, especially in the last 15 years. Um, it's also more increasingly being used for um, language teaching, so corpus research allows you to look at the most frequent reoccurring words, the frequently recurring um, collocations, word clusters, and that can be a basis for creating materials. And if you're doing the practicum or have done the practicum, you probably have used Touchstone, which is one of the first um, our course books for second language learners, which was based heavily on corpus linguistics. 
Um, another way on just on a on a on a classroom level for classroom teachers how they can use it is by having a look at um, doing very many 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 um, uh, uh, corpus analysis. For example, if you're trying to teach the difference between will and going to, you could build a little corpus of um, uh, weather reports. These were taken from the New York Times. And as you can see in the New York Times, what you get is a high, high use of will uh, in terms of weather prediction. Well, not just the um, New York Times. In fact, most written weather forecast te texts use will. And you can contrast that with um, um, spoken texts. So here's the, um, the New York Times written forecast compared with WOBUB-TV uh, spoken text. Um, so um, these are tiny, tiny corpora, 6,000 for the New York Times and 3,000 for um, the TV spoken weather forecast. And as you can see, um, uh, depending on whether it's written or spoken, you get a complete difference in the use of will or going to. So virtually all the um, choices made in the New York Times weather forecast is, to, is that of the will future. Um, just a few tokens of going to, but in the spoken report, um, what you find is that um, uh, the use of will recedes and the use of going to expands. So um, it's kind of an obverse um, relationship. So that's the kind of um, interesting material um, that you can develop on a very small basis for your particular um, classroom teaching. Um, one other use of um, corpus linguistics is um, <coughs> translation. Um, and I don't believe Cutting mentions um, um, the use in translation. Here is some, um, this is taken from a website. Uh, it's an Italian, very exclusive Italian children's clothes um, site, website. And they have um, uh, English and Italian. Um, are the Italian is uh, on one side and the English on the other. So what we can do, and we call these parallel texts, and we can have compare how it's said in English with how it's said in Italian, which is a very useful tool. And it's going back to grammar translation. Translation has always been a very useful tool of uh, language learning. Um, further uses are corpus linguistics. So um, um, of corpus linguistics is forensic, forensic linguistics. So with large amounts of text, we can begin to look at what are the common patterns um, uh, of particular um, communities of practice. And that can be a way of determining um, evidence in, say, a, a, law, a, a, a court of law. Um, this was one particular um, use of corpus linguistics with regard to forensic linguistics um, that happened about 10, 15 years ago. Um, our uh, McDonald's challenged um, a, a logo that was put out um, called Mac Sleep, um, and they claimed that uh, Mac was their domain and they owned it. Forensic linguists then had to compile uh, corpora in which they tried to show how that Mac could collocate with many, uh, many, many things, uh, not only. Um, Big Macs and McMuffin and McDonald's. Um, actually, unfortunately, they lost this, and uh, <laughs> McDonald's did uh, win the case, and that's why you don't see Mac sleep um, anywhere. Okay. Um, finally, um, some of the um, are, um, critiques of um, corpus linguistics, which are based around this distinction distinction between. Um, data which is invented or introspective, and data which is attested or corpus data. So invented sentences or um, introspective sentences are things like the cat set on the map. The philosopher pulled the lower jaw of the hen. Hmm, crazy. The rain in Spain falls mainly on the plains, or if you want it in Spanish, and I'm not going to pronounce it because I can't, but... Uh, um, notice these are particular invented sentences, and they're invented for language learning purposes. Whereas a tested uh, corpus data is naturally occurring, okay. and as you would you, you would think that um, 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 
it's important to have knowledge of naturally occurring data. Uh, but there are two ways of looking at this. Um, you know, just as corpora can reveal the truths about the language that introspection can't, so introspection can reveal truths that corpora cannot. And what this is referring to um, is the way that you can manipulate sentences and you can tell whether something works or doesn't work. It's a very common device in um, syntax uh, to use um, uh, introspected or invented data. Let me just quote something that Blakemore um, said about her use. And Blakemore is, um, works in the fields of pragmatics and semantics. And what she argues is that um, corpus data provide positive evidence on which to make generalizations, whereas often um, more can be learned from data in the form of constructed examples about where expressions cannot occur, especially in order to distinguish the subtle differences for example, between discourse markers like nevertheless, still, and yet. Yeah. And that's an area that I have worked in, and I've used both um, uh, corpus data and introspective data. So it's not the case that one is superior to uh, the other. It's a case that they're both very useful tools for looking at language. And in pragmatics, we use both. We use corpus data and we use invented data.